Enjoy. My guest today is Dr. Javier Gonzalez, Senior Lecturer in Human Physiology at the University of Bath. He's published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in renowned scientific journals. Javier has a PhD in Human Nutrition and Metabolism, and his research seeks to understand the interactions between nutrition and exercise in the context of health and disease. One strand of this work is to explore the role of carbohydrate availability in the regulation of energy balance, metabolic health, and sports performance. In recognition of this work, he's received the Julie Wallace Award in 2018 by the Nutrition Society. Javier, really appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks for the invitation. Terrific. Well, before we start talking breakfast, weight loss, obesity, and uh, some personalized nutrition here today, um, can you start things off by telling listeners a little bit more about your background and how you got into research? Yes. um, I firstly conducted a a degree in sport and exercise science uh, at Nottingham Trent. And um, it was when I was performing my final year research project that I realized uh, research would would be really interesting as a career. So I then pursued a a master's by research at the same institution um, before then moving um, up to the north of England in Newcastle, where I completed a PhD under the supervision of Professor Emma Stevenson. Um, And that was on... um, a bit about breakfast, um, but also some um, some of it was working on protein and calcium and, and appetite hormones. I then stayed in Newcastle where I completed a postdoc, um, and that was to investigate the role of carbohydrates during and after exercise on muscle and liver metabolism, and that was in relation to endurance athletes. Um, before I then moved to the south of England, where I, I'm currently based at Bath, um, I've been here for just over four years now. Um, and it was nice to move to Bath because um, there were already a group of researchers performing research on, on breakfast as well. So it was nice to join Dr. James Betts and Professor Dylan Thompson in that area. And uh, recently, we've also got Dr. Francoise Kumanov, who's a cell biologist interested in, in glucose metabolism too. So we've got a nice um, group there of collaborators who who's, uh, it's a pleasure to work with. Fantastic. Well, that's Perfect segue here. Let's start things off with talking breakfast and obesity. Uh, You wrote a chapter uh, in the Practical Guide for Obesity Medicine called Breakfast for the Prevention and Treatment of Obesity. So could you maybe give listeners a little bit of a lay of the lands of the landscape and the scientific research as it relates to breakfast and obesity? Certainly. Um, Well, breakfast is is a meal that many people consume. So if you typically ask um, a general population in a in a developed country, how many people consume breakfast then? Um, typically around two thirds and maybe even more um, people would say they're a breakfast consumer. Um, what we might define as breakfast is a little bit tricky. Some people might think it has to be um, a solid meal or semi-solid meal with cereal or something similar. Um, whereas some people might not think they're having breakfast, but they might be having a, a huge um, latte with loads of sugar in it, not realizing that they're ingesting a load of calories and Essentially, for, for their physiology, that is consuming a breakfast if it was consumed um, within within two hours of waking. Um, and breakfast is has there are a lot of myths and, and um, preconceptions around the effects of breakfast on health. For sure, um, we we commonly hear people say things like breakfast is the most important meal of the day. We should really not skip breakfast. Um, and it's understandable why people think that because if you just survey people and measure their weights, then people who say they're a breakfast consumer are much less likely to be overweight or obese than people who regularly skip breakfast. But what we're interested in is whether there's a cause and effect relationship between breakfast consumption and obesity. And the problem when you're doing these observational studies um, is that we can't understand cause and effect. We can just understand these associations. And there are a number of other confounding variables that, that can play a role there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tricky one to unravel with all the different variables there. And in terms of, you know, those observational studies, where are we at in the sense of um, being able to say, you know, you mentioned there breakfast eaters typically will have a lower body weight. Um, and of course, you know, weight loss is about energy balance. I think a lot of listeners would say, well, if someone's reducing their caloric intake by not eating breakfast, sometimes dramatically, you know, wouldn't that help lead to weight loss? So perhaps you can do maybe a quick energy balance review and then circle back to, to how that may impact the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our, our 
body weight over time um, is primarily dictated by our energy balance. Um, An energy balance um, is the balance between energy consumed um, and energy expended. So if we we break that down further on the energy intake side, the food we consume, um, we mainly derive energy from carbohydrates, fats and protein. um, And we can also, as humans, derive some energy from alcohol or ethanol as well. Um, And it's also dependent on the amount we actually absorb. So we would term it metabolizable energy is the amount of the energy that we've eaten that is actually absorbed across the intestine and that we don't just excrete out straight away. Yep. Um, but we know that mo- most of what we eat is going to get absorbed. So that excretion part is, is really minimal. Um, so we, we've got energy intake and then we've got energy expenditure. And that can be broken down into three main components. We've got resting metabolic rate, which is the energy we we use just to maintain all of our bodily functions at, at rest. We've then got dietary induced thermogenesis or the thermic effect of feeding. And um, that's the energy we invest in digesting, metabolizing and storing or, or oxidizing the food that we've eaten. Um, and that's why you might sometimes feel a little bit hot after eating a large meal. And um, the effects of different foods on dietary induced thermogenesis are quite interesting. So protein has quite a large thermic effect. Um, So up to 30% of the energy that is in protein can be essentially wasted as heat loss um, due to this dietary induced thermogenesis. And um, what's less well known is that ethanol also has quite a high thermic effect. So here in the UK, um, some people use the term a a beer jacket, which is where if they've drunk a (laughs) a lot of alcohol, they feel a bit warmer. Um, And that's primarily due to this dietary induced thermogenesis. Um, We've then got physical activity, energy expenditure, um, and that encompasses all of the um, energy that muscles use um, to produce force um, and and movement. Um, That spans from um, exercise, as as we typically think of, like running and cycling, but right down to things that we're not really aware we're doing. So we might be fidgeting, um, chewing, chewing gum, um, even just, just the energy cost of standing um, is counts as physical activity, energy expenditure, and that that can add up to quite a significant amount across a day. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, some of your work in terms of activity levels between groups that eat breakfast and don't eat gre- breakfast. Um, can you talk about some of the work you've done with accelerometers and assessing that activity level between breakfast eaters and people who abstain from breakfast? Yeah, yeah. Well, here herein lies one of the problems with the observational studies because um, people who regularly consume breakfast are also more likely to lead a healthy lifestyle in in many other ways, including physical activity. So we don't, this is one of the reasons why we don't know whether breakfast is the cause for this lower body mass in people who regularly eat breakfast, because it may be that they're more physically active and it's the physical activity that is is driving this. So going to the gym, going for a run, all these things are just embedded into their routine, right? Exactly, yeah. They're also more likely to eat um, more fruit and vegetables, less likely to smoke, um, and a number of other things too. Um, so this um, prompted James Betts, one of my colleagues now, it was before I came to Bath actually, um, to run a, a randomized controlled trial um, to understand the effects of breakfast on energy balance. So what he did was recruited a group of lean and a group of obese um, volunteers, and they were randomly assigned for six weeks to either consume breakfast every day um, or fast every day um, or extend their morning fast. And, and it was quite an extreme intervention. So the fasting group couldn't consume any stimulating nutrients until midday every day. So they'd wake up in the morning. They were allowed essentially water only, um, whereas the breakfast group um, had to consume at least 700 calories before um, 11 a.m. Um, so it was kind of a proof of principle. That is a large breakfast. Um, yep. Most people tended to eat a relatively high carbohydrate breakfast too. And, and so we're interested in in the future looking at whether manipulating the type of breakfast is important. But based on this study, it seems that when people self-select a breakfast, it, it tends to be high carbohydrate. And what, what James found was that um, randomizing people to consume breakfast increased their physical activity Um, across the whole day, but in particular in the morning. Um, This was more apparent in in the lean cohort that he he studied, um, but it was was quite a substantial amount too. So 
Um, the the energy energy they were eating was um, at least 700 calories in the morning, and the increase in physical activity energy expenditure compared to the fasting group was about 440 calories per day, kilocalories per day. Um, wow. So that, that's quite a lot. Yeah, it's, it's equivalent to, to going to the gym for for many people for about an hour or so. What does the research show in terms of that blood glucose control? Whether someone's abstaining from breakfast or eating breakfast, and you know, does it matter if they're actually lean or obese? Yeah, this is something I, I'm really interested in. It's, it's known as the second meal effect, um, whereby your response – so if, if we start off with, with glucose control, first of all. So whenever we eat a meal containing carbohydrates, um, our blood sugar levels or blood glucose concentrations will rise. And they'll peak at about – if we're healthy, then about 30 to 60 minutes. And then they'll fall back down again to pretty much baseline by around two hours. Um, and – the, we need to control that, that glucose in, in, in this tight range. Um, otherwise, we get a number of complications such as cardiovascular disease and, and damage to various blood vessels. And, and ultimately, we can develop type 2 diabetes if, if blood glucose levels rise too high. Yep. Um, and what's interesting is if we consume a meal um, in the morning, let's say we have our breakfast, then our response, our glucose response to lunch, our glucose control is better than if we'd fasted in the morning. And that's known as the, the second meal effect. Um, we're not f fully aware um, of the mechanisms that, that um, regulate that, um, but it could be related to um, improvements in insulin sensitivity. So that is, um, insulin is the main hormone that, that regulates our blood sugar levels. And um, if we're more insulin sensitive, then um, for the same amount of insulin, we'll get better glucose control. Essentially, our, our tissues, such as our muscle, will take up more glucose out of the bloodstream for the same amount of insulin if they're more insulin sensitive. Um, it may also relate to some, some of the liver glucose output. So the liver is constantly putting out glucose into the bloodstream. And what this second, what might happen with this second meal effect is that we get a greater suppression of glucose output from the liver with our second meal. Yeah, you mentioned insulin there. And I think that's definitely one where, you know, obviously today with about two thirds of the population being overweight or obese, and at least in America, some, some of the studies showing, you know, up to 50% pre-diabetic or diabetic. And so this elevated insulin, can you talk a bit about its impact on fat oxidation and what that might um, you know, hinder then for, for, for folks who are trying to lose weight? Yeah. Um, so a high insulin level is, is, or concentration in the blood is, is one of the earliest signs of, um, insulin resistance. Um, and what's happening there is that, um, the pancreas, which is the tissue, the organ that secretes insulin is, is compensating for the um, decrease in insulin sensitivity. So it's secreting more insulin in order to maintain a stable blood sugar level. But the problem with that is that insulin doesn't just affect glucose uh, metabolism, it also affects um, fat metabolism and, and many other things too. Um, and what it does in, in regards to fat metabolism is it suppresses fat oxidation and it suppresses lipolysis. So that's the breakdown of fat in, in adipose or fat tissue. Um, so it's essentially stimulating the pathways of, of fat storage and suppressing the pathways of, of fat breakdown. Um, and th there is some confusion in the, in the literature and definitely some conflict between um, human studies and non-human studies in this area. So um, there's some work by Jim Johnson um, in using rodent models um, that suggests that high insulin concentrations um, accelerate weight gain in certain models um, and that still may be acting through energy balance. So in those studies, it seems like um, the, the lower insulin level in the blood seems to be associated with a higher physical activity level or at least a higher energy expenditure in these rodents. There's then some human data um, and Kevin Hall's done a lot of great work in this area recently. Yep. Um, where under very tightly controlled conditions, drastically changing the carbohydrate and fat content of the diet in order to manipulate insulin concentrations um, can change, um, sorry, doesn't lead to any differences in weight loss that would be predicted by, by energy balance. So essentially, energy balance seems to be key, whereas insulin is, is important for regulating substrate metabolism and directing whether we're oxidizing fat or storing fat or, or oxidizing carbohydrate, 
if we're if we're purely interested in at least long term changes in in body weight and fat mass, then energy balance is really key. Yeah, hundred percent, definitely that energy balance being so pivotal. And so I guess it begs the question for some folks who are trying to kickstart uh, weight loss, or if they're they are struggling with uh, you know pre diabetes or metabolic syndrome, um, is there a potential advantage then for whether it's an intermittent fasting eating strategy or perhaps even a low carb to start the day of, of facilitating a, a caloric reduction then throughout the day? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, in terms of intermittent fasting, um, uh, one of our, our PhD students is just writing up his thesis at the moment, and I, I won't steal his thunder, but he's got some <laughs> interesting data <laughs> coming out there too, um, especially in relation to, to physical activity levels on days when people fast versus days when, when people are eating. Um, but if, if we focus on, on the role of breakfast here and, and that fasting in the morning, um, certainly if, if we um, skip breakfast, we don't tend to, at least within the next 24 hours, compensate with any increase in, in energy intake. Um, but we do seem to reduce our, our energy expenditure. Um, that is at least when we're, we're not really aware or conscious of what we're doing. Maybe we can do something about that, though, and, and we might want to con- consider performing exercise sessions in the morning. Um, then we're fixing, essentially fixing or prescribing our energy expenditure um, because the, the role, the way in which breakfast is regulating energy expenditure and physical activity isn't through changing the amount of exercise people are doing. It's mainly the, the spontaneous type of physical activity that we're, we're not really conscious of. So just little things like fidgeting and so on, which we could potentially offset if we're aware of that. So if you are looking to lose weight and and I think there are there are various strategies that you can use, and it's probably a case of of trying a few ones and seeing which, which one you you find easiest to adhere to. Um, but if if fasting in the morning is one that you'd like to try, then um, just being aware that your physical activity levels might be lower, and you might have a propensity to to be a little bit uh, lazier, if you like, in the morning, for want of a, a better term. Mm-hmm. But at least you know that, and you can do something about it. Yeah, I mean, obviously you hit on something crucial there, which is that an adherence component of all this in terms of whether it's weight loss, better health. Um, you know, you touched on it a little bit, but again, how important is that individual's preference when it comes to whether it's breakfast or the nutrition strategy that they choose to to apply? Yeah, I, I think it's critical to both uh, the exercise and, and, and diet. So clearly it energy balance is simple on the one hand but it's so difficult to adhere to in at least in the long term um so if people like to follow a particular diet whether it's low carbohydrate ketogenic or higher in protein um higher in carbohydrate low fat as long as they can adhere to an energy deficit on that diet then that's probably a a good one for them to follow um it seems and and um Susan Jeb's done some great work on this, that there are actually quite minimal differences in the metabolic effects of different diets as long as weight loss is occurring. So if you take someone who um, has obesity, for example, then their metabolic health probably isn't, isn't going to be very good, or at least in the long term, their prognosis isn't, isn't going to be great. If they're losing weight almost by any means, then their metabolic health will improve. And there are actually very minor differences between the types of diets. And and you can probably say the same about exercise too. People often ask me, well, what's the best type of exercise to do? And probably the best answer you can give to that is the one that you're going to do regularly. Keep doing, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. And um, if we continue down this road of even sort of pre-exercise breakfast versus extended overnight fasting for folks who want to do some exercise in the morning, um, could you talk about some of the potential advantages then and how glycogen plays a role in, in terms of what substrates are going to be utilized for energy? Yeah. Um, so with with exercise, we're, we're going to be burning a mixture of carbohydrates and fats as a fuel. And when I'm talking about exercise now, I'm typically talking about um, running and cycling and kind of endurance type exercise. Yeah. Um, and if you if you do that in the fasted state, um, then you typically see an increase in fat oxidation and a decrease in carbohydrate oxidation. And um, a recent study that um, one of my PhD students, Rob Edinburgh, has published with the help of other other PhD students such as, as Aaron Hengist, um, what they showed was um, when we consume breakfast prior to exercise, uh, 
um, then we the carbohydrate, the increase in carbohydrate oxidation is coming from blood glucose, but also an increase in muscle glycogen utilization. And that might seem a little bit counterintuitive. Um, we sometimes think that maybe if we're, if we're eating carbohydrate, we might be able to spare our muscle glycogen stores during exercise. Um, that doesn't actually seem to be the case under most conditions. There are a few studies that have shown some muscle glycogen sparing during exercise, but that's with a lot of carbohydrate ingestion, both before and during exercise. Here we're talking about eating a, a breakfast with a very modest amount of carbohydrate. So your typical kind of oatmeal or porridge, um, mm -hmm. 65 grams of carbohydrate or so, and two hours before exercise. And if, if we look back at some of the other literature, that, and um, Professor Roy Taylor, who's, who's now up in Newcastle, he's, um, he's published studies back in the past looking at muscle glycogen concentrations after eating a meal. Quite a basic question. And what you find is that about an hour after eating a mixed meal containing some carbohydrate is that muscle glycogen concentrations actually go down from the fasting level before they then rise over the subsequent few hours. Interesting. What, yeah, it's, it's, it is a, a great study. And um, what we think is going on there is that um, you eat your meal, you get your big insulin spike straight away. And that's causing our muscle to switch from fat to carbohydrate metabolism. And it's happening so quickly that that's before much of the carbohydrate from the meal has actually entered the bloodstream and got to the muscle. So we've got this window where there's increased carbohydrate metabolism in the muscle, but that is not matched by carbohydrate delivery to the muscle. Um, so we get this little window where there's a decrease in muscle glycogen concentration. And if we start exercise at that time, we might not be able to spare muscle glycogen. And, and what we found in, in this recent study is that um, when we took muscle biopsies, there was quite a lot of a suggestion that um, all of the, the signaling pathways in muscle um, that are associated with low muscle glycogen, so these are pathways known as the, the AMPK pathway, that was all upregulated when breakfast was consumed prior to exercise. And it, it was a little bit paradoxical at first, but then when I remember that study by Roy Taylor, it all, all started to make sense. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating stuff, especially as it um, relates to context, whether someone's yeah, trying to lose weight versus you know athletes who are deliberately uh, training in, in low-carb um, states to facilitate some of those adaptations. So um, really, yeah. really interesting stuff. And if we continue uh, down this road a little bit and, and talk about you know dietary fructose versus glucose when it comes to to weight gain or, or even added fructose, especially you know when we consider again, unfortunately, most people are overweight, and so there is this caloric excess. So, is there anything particularly, for lack of a better term, fattening about excessive fructose in that state when we're in a caloric excess? So if I start by um, just describing the, the differences between fructose and, and glucose as a kind of comparison sugar, um, when we consume glucose, then um, most of that is going to be absorbed across the intestine via a specific transporter called SGLT1. And then that glucose enters um, the bloodstream. It essentially bypasses the liver and goes to most of it will end up in our muscle. So typically around 80% of the, the glucose that we eat will be metabolized by our muscle. So it'll either be stored as glycogen or burnt as a fuel. Um, if we compare that to fructose, when we, when we ingest fructose, most of the fructose will be absorbed across the intestine by a different transport protein known as GLUT5. Um, and muscle can't really metabolize fructose very efficiently. So the liver is actually the primary site of, of um, fructose metabolism in humans. Um, the intestine can also do a little bit of fructose metabolism, as can the kidneys as well. Um, and what the liver does and, and these other tissues is converts the fructose into other substrates that can be used by muscle. Um, so the liver converts the fructose into lactate um, and into glucose and also some of it into fat. So that, that process is known as de novo lipogenesis or the production of fat from non-fat sources. And this is where a lot of the, uh, again, a few myths and misconceptions around fructose occur because yes, fructose does stimulate de novo lipogenesis, the conversion of, of carbohydrate to fat. Um, but when you actually quantify how much of the fructose has been converted into fat, it's very, very small. It's, it's less than 1% of the ingested fructose load. So it's, it's a tiny amount, and it's probably not enough to influence our levels of body fat, 
but it probably or may have more of a role in, in metabolic regulation and maybe in our metabolic health. Um, so if I just go back to your question that during overfeeding, what we tend to see with overfeeding fructose compared to glucose is that we can get an increase in levels of fat in the blood. Um, and that may be partly due to this de novo lipogenesis route. It may also be that fructose um, can suppress oxidation of fat. So the, the levels of fat in the blood are always dependent on um, the amount of fat that is ingested and being produced and the, the amount of fat that's being oxidized. And fructose can potentially inhibit fat oxidation and increase the, the production of new fat. Um, and that can lead to an increase in, in the levels of fat in the blood. Um, this is only really seen in sedentary conditions and in people who are, are overweight already. When the same studies are done in, in relatively healthy people, um, then effects on peripheral insulin sensitivity, so on the insulin sensitivity of the muscle, that doesn't seem to be affected by fructose compared to glucose or other carbohydrate sources. Um, what, what is commonly seen is that high fructose intakes um, can potentially um, suppress hepatic insulin sensitivity. So that is insulin sensitivity of the liver. I'd just like to throw in one caveat to that as well, and that For is sure. that physical activity seems to be a, a potent regulator of this. So all these studies, and a lot of them have been done by uh, Professor Luke Tappy over in Lausanne, um, he, he's done a lot of these studies with overfeeding fructose, and then in recent years, he's been understanding the interaction with exercise. And um, there's, a, there's a great study by um, from his group um, by Leonie Egli, um, where they overfed people on a high fructose diet for four days. Um, and in one condition, they also exercised on those days. And it wasn't a huge amount of exercise. It was only about 45 minutes or so of a relatively light intensity cycling. Okay. Um, and importantly, because they were expending more energy when they exercised, they overfed them even more fructose to um, maintain energy balance. And what they found was that um, it, the exercise completely obliterated almost all of the metabolic effects of, of fructose overfeeding. That's incredible. So, yeah, it's a really potent um, stimulus is exercise. And I think we need to understand that interaction between physical activity and, and nutrition more. Um, and just to, to finish on the, the fructose area and obesity, um, the, the reason that Sugar intakes, uh, I think rightly so, uh, uh, the guidelines are to limit free sugar intakes is primarily because a diet that is high in sugars and um, because most sugars contain fructose, this is why it's caught up in that, um, diets high in sugars tend to be energy dense. So per gram of food, there's a lot of energy in there. Mm -hmm. If you think, for example, a, a, a cake or a biscuit that, that has a lot of, of sugar in it there's also a lot of energy in a small volume of food compared to example for example a big salad or um, a big bowl of vegetables and therefore high diets high in free sugars um, are associated with weight gain and, and obesity so i think certainly we need to think about the the role of sugars in the diet for um, overweight and obesity i think it's mainly in acting through um energy density. Um, and there are some interesting metabolic effects specifically of fructose. Um, but I don't think that that can account for the, the changes in body fat. Yeah, it's really compelling stuff. And it's interesting that context that you mentioned in terms of if, if people are exercising and they're already lean and there seems to be obviously no issue. And then as people gain weight and are uh, more sedentary, obviously not just the fructose, but just overconsumption of a of an energy dense diet can lead to all these trickle down effects. And um, Javier, what are the impacts of those elevated triglycerides just on the, on the brain and leptin and some of the, uh, the you know, the appetite control signals? Mm, yeah. Um, so, well, the, the, probably the most important factor I always think about with a high level of triglycerides in the blood is, is cardiovascular disease. Um, so having a high level of, of triglycerides in the blood is probably one of the most important first steps in atherosclerosis. Um, so the the buildup of fatty plaques in the arteries that, that ultimately leads to cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. But, but what overeating can also do, as you, as you allude to there, is um, cause something known as leptin resistance. So leptin is a, a hormone um, that regulates appetite. It's secreted from our fat tissue primarily. 
and um, it acts on the brain to tell us that we're full, that we don't need to, to eat so much. So that makes sense. As we gain weight and we gain body fat, we secrete more leptin because that's the tissue that it's secreted from. And then our brain should respond to that and we eat less. But what happens if we essentially force, um, force ourselves to override that and, and overeat and gain weight, then we can become leptin resistant. Um, so our brain isn't responding to those signals quite so sensitively. Um, and, and then it becomes even more challenging to, to regulate appetite and energy intake. And Javier, in terms of, you know, uh, that regulation there, I mean, obviously if people are stranded on a desert Island, it's a lot easier to, uh, to control those things. But in, in today's food environment with, you know, the hyper palatable energy dense foods around, um, you know, what role is food environment playing in all this? Yeah, I think it, it does play a, a really strong role. Um, we see pockets of obesity in areas where there are a lot of fast food outlets, for example. Uh, I think it also goes hand in hand with, with the physical activity environment. Again, um, both of these um, are important to consider. It's so easy nowadays to um, take the elevator rather than the stairs, um, take the car rather than cycle or walk to work. Um, and at the same time, it's so easy to pick up cheap, energy dense food. Um, it's, it's always um, readily available and it's difficult to resist. Um, if we are trying. Tastes to, pretty good, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <tastes pretty good. laughs> um, and to, to be in an energy deficit, um, we have to. Um, we have to try to, to not eat so, so much of that energy dense food. And it becomes even more tricky when we're in the energy deficit, because essentially when we fasted for a period, all of our, our signals are heightened um, towards wanting um, energy dense, sweet and, and fatty foods. Um, so the, it, psychology certainly isn't my area, but I think that is, is really important um, to study how we could potentially modulate people's um, wanting and um, liking for en energy dense foods. And we can probably learn a lot from um, a model of, of surgery known as Ruanwai gastric bypass surgery. Uh, what's fascinating there is where people with, um, who, are, who are overweight or obese undergo this specific type of surgery, um, it, it changes their, their gut hormone profile. So we release a certain number of hormones from the gut that, that also signal to our brain around appetite and, and food preferences. And when this is altered in, in these people, they almost immediately after surgery don't really um, fancy eating these energy dense foods. So maybe we can understand that better and tailor new strategies use, using that as an example. Yeah, it's definitely a fascinating, uh, particularly that research around yeah the, the surgeries and those changes from a hormonal level. Um, mm -hmm. This sort of dovetails into the area of personalized nutrition. Um, you wrote a great article a few years ago with James Betts called "Personalized Nutrition: What Makes You So Special." Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe the, you know the fundamentals then of, of nutrition for weight loss and health, and where this idea of you know is personalization possible? Is it and how much does it make up really of someone's um, protocol or diet? Yeah, um, this is a, a huge area. So I'll, I'll stick mainly to um, the body mass and energy balance areas as that's kind of the, the theme of this. Um, and there are a number of genetic variants, for example, that, that associate with body mass. Um, some have very extreme effects. So there's one um, particular genetic mutation that is very, very rare. Um, but if, if someone has this specific genetic mutation, then they essentially completely lack the hormone leptin. So they, they don't secrete any le leptin at all. And that means their appetite is through the roof. Um, their brain is just driving them to eat. And these, these people are usually diagnosed really early on because even as, um, as very young children, they have a huge, huge body mass. They have a huge body weight. Um, they're eating huge meals. Uh, um, but the good thing is that can be cured once it's diagnosed very easily with some leptin injections. Yep. Um, but that's, as I say, a very rare example. There are a few cases in the world of people who have that condition. Most of the genetic variation across the general population that explains typical um, levels of obesity has a very, very small effect. And um, the, one of the first genes to be associated with common obesity is, is known as the FTO gene or the fat mass and obesity associated gene. Um, 
And a, a few years after that was discovered, um, it was shown that um, it correlated with, with obesity, but it, it made a very small effect. So if you have the, the high risk version of this gene, um, then you essentially just have a, a, a likely to have a couple more kilos of, of body weight compared to someone with the low risk version of this gene. But the interesting thing was the same group of people who were, were studying that also assessed people's physical activity level. And if people were physically active, um, it drastically attenuated the, the essentially the effect of, of this gene on their body weight. Uh, and the, the association with physical activity seems to be stronger than most of these associations with genes. So again, whilst they do play a role, your, your genes can influence your propensity to perhaps eat more or be less physically active. Similar to the fasting and breakfast condition, um, we're humans, we're conscious beings and we're, we're aware of what we're doing and um, we can usually do something about that with um, a careful strategy. Absolutely. Um, 100%. And in, in terms of this idea though of, of even individual responses to things, um, could you speak a little bit to the, you know, some of the overfeeding studies where, you know, participants are fed, you know, 500, 1,000 calories extra per day and, and yet the, the weight gain obviously varies significantly amongst individuals. Um, is, yeah. is that an area where personalized nutrition is going to be helpful or are there other things going on with those folks that are leading to that, to the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll probably cover two points on this first around, um, individual variability across, across all conditions. And that is that, um, it's difficult to truly understand, um, whether someone is, is a, non-responder or responder if you like from from just a single observation um in a study so when people go through a study we we might see that when we measure people's response to that intervention some people seem to have responded in a huge way so we'd call them a, a big responder or a super responder some people may not have responded at all or may have even gone the other way so they might might be called a non-responder or a negative responder um one thing we don't know is whether how, how good our measurement tool is in that particular exam, example or in that particular scenario. Um, and so no measurement tool is 100% perfect. So some of the variability that we see might simply be due to measurement error. But even if we account for that, we've still got biological variability. So the only way we can really understand true inter-individual differences between people, uh, um, or the best way to understand this, is with something known as a, a repeated randomized controlled trial where essentially everyone conducts the study um, twice. So if you repeat the study in the same individuals and if the same person shows um, a very big response on two occasions, then you can be pretty confident that they may truly be a, a super responder. Um, in relation to some of the studies on, on weight gain, um, the, the usual one I, I um, use in teaching and, and when I'm presenting is one by James Levine where they overfed people for eight weeks and they overfed them a thousand kilocalories per day surplus. Um, so over that time there's a predicted amount of body fat that they should have gained um, but there was huge amount of variability in, in the am am amount of fat gain that, that occurred. Um, but what was really nice about this study was that they quantified all of the um, places where that extra energy could have gone. So some of it, of course, did go into adipose tissue. Um, some of it was essentially lost as, as an increase in resting metabolic rate, increased dietary-induced thermogenesis, but also quite a large proportion um, was expended through increases in, in physical activity. So when people were overfed at the group level, there was an increase in physical activity, but there was also quite a lot of variability between people. And it was the change in physical activity that was the strongest predictor of the change in body fat. So when wow. a group of people were overfed, people who increased their, and this again is spontaneous physical activity, things like fidgeting and, and things they're not really aware of, um, people who increased their spontaneous physical activity more gained less body fat over the eight weeks of the intervention. Yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff, isn't it? I don't think most people think of, you know, fidgeting and these these sort of marginal gains as places where there's such a pronounced effect happening, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It does does really does add up. And um, what one of the professors here at Bath, um, Dylan Thompson, has collected data on on a variety of people, and 
and always find huge variability between people in, in physical activity levels. So um, if you take, for example, a, a group of middle-aged men um, who don't really report doing much exercise whatsoever, um, then physical activity is, is the biggest um, variance uh, that the, explains most of the variance in their total energy expenditure. So their resting metabolic rate is largely similar because that's mainly predicted by just body size or, or lean mass. Dietary induced thermogenesis is relatively similar. And yet someone at the lowest end of the spectrum might only expend about 200 kilocalories a day through physical activity. They might um, get up in the morning, drive to work, sit at a desk all day, drive home and watch television in the evening versus someone at the other end of the spectrum can easily expend over a thousand kilocalories a day, some, some approaching 2000 kilocalories a day. And they might be the ones who have an active commute to work. They might have a manual job and then they're out playing in the garden with their kids in the evening or something similar. Yeah. It's uh, it's really, really amazing just how some of those things embed themselves, obviously in people's patterns and people's habits. And as you mentioned, just the, the biggest driver in a lot of this. So Javier, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Fantastic insights here. So before we wrap up, uh, just the last couple questions for you. Mm -hmm. The first one is, uh, is breakfast the most important meal of the day for weight loss? <laughs> Save the loaded questions for last. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, and yeah, I, I think whether breakfast is the most important meal of the day is um, you'd have to define what's important um, and what's important for you. And um, it's certainly not the most important meal if, if weight loss is your goal, because um, ultimately it's around, about your whole diet and your physical activity level too. Fantastic. I think the question a lot of listeners are probably waiting to hear is, what is your morning breakfast or non-breakfast routine, Javier? <laughs> um, so I, I'm a creature of habit. Um, I have oatmeal or porridge pretty much every day but I have it after I've cycled to work. So I do my exercise fasted and then um, I have my porridge at, at work. Awesome. That's fantastic. Listen, really appreciate it again you taking the time, Javier. You know, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your fantastic research? Great. Thanks. Thanks again for the invite, Mark. So um, I'm on Twitter, um, at Gonzalez underscore JT. Um, and I've also got a, a page on the University of Bath website where people can see our, our latest publications. Fantastic. I'll definitely include those links and some of the papers we talked about